everybody welcome to the faith and fandom podcast this is hector mirai and i am back with the second installment of so i finally started watching the chosen today we're going to be covering episodes four through eight which is the end of season one and uh yeah so if you missed (laughs) the first one maybe go back if you care but uh I have long been told to watch the series The Chosen, and I'm just now getting around to it because uh, someone that cares literally walked in my house and threw the first two seasons on Blu-ray at me to get me started. <laughs> so, just finished season one, so I uh, wrote a song about it, like to hear it, hear it go. Um, first off, uh, we pick back up season and episode four with Peter on the verge of betraying... Uh, the guards again i never really saw peter as the spy mastermind to be able to do something like that of uh betraying his people cunningly for profit or whatever so the fact that he uh backtracked on it and couldn't go through with it uh tracks a lot more with me um let me also make this note uh andrew looks like bruno from encanto like every time i see andrew on screen my thought is this dude looks like what Bruno would look like in a live action. So Peter going back and telling people or telling the other, uh, merchants and fishermen, what he was up to. And the fact he was honest about it really dug that. I thought that was a good character development plot point. Um, uh, but also started to feed into the desperation of Peter's situation. Um, and it was at a, probably about that point where I realized that's where they were heading with the um, castronets on the other side miracle um, heading into it. Um, but yeah, jumping back over to the relationship between Matthew and Quintus. Um, Quintus is a a very um, well cast uh, maniacal villain. I could see him be easily being a good Lex Luthor or something to that effect. Um, he also reminds me of Peter Furler from the Newsboys late 90s era. So that's a thing. But uh, uh, Matthew and Quintus's relationship in episode four um, of the whole back and forth of um, him feeling the pressure of being that spy not wanting to actually have to spy on Peter, that situation, it's its own things. Um, But then I I just really like the portrayal of of Matthew the more I watch of this. Um, We jump over to the Pharisees uh, now having beef with John the Baptist uh, (laughs) and the preaching of repentance and baptism and Shmuel or Shmuel uh, being the Pharisee who's obviously on the rise Um, you know, it was, uh, it was really interesting to see how quickly this dude was playing John for his, um, for his outcome and advantage. And it also makes me a little bit sad that we didn't get to see a portrayal of, um, Jesus's baptism or John's actual ministry. I don't know. Maybe that comes in a later flashback or anything like that. But I'm kind of sad that the first time you actually see John the Baptist is in prison. But it is what it is. And I know they can't do everything. And uh, there are limited options with that. Um, Them dropping off Peter's uh, mother-in-law at the house uh, was fun. I appreciated that. Uh, That helps further this story along. Because that's one of the things. Scripture never talks about uh, Peter's wife. Other than the fact to say that he had a mother-in-law. And when I first uh, posted about this show, uh, someone told me, someone commented uh, that Eden was their favorite character. And the more I watch of this, the more I truly uh, vibe with Eden. I think she's a really well-written and well-rounded character. And you know what? I hope Peter had a wife as cool as Eden. I genuinely do. Um, but setting up... Uh, the situation for Jesus to be able to heal Peter's mother-in-law later is an important setup. Um, and I love the way they timed it out, um, with their departure later on in like episode seven or eight. Um, but Peter's obstinance about actually taking her, the family burden, all adding to the, um, compilation of 
the anxiety and stress of Peter's performance and everything that comes with it, with his marriage and his faith. And for Eden to actually be upset with him for not being the man of God that he once was. Because I think we can all relate to that, that at some point in time, we get caught up in the the back and forth and the making things happen to the point where we stop pursuing God the way that we originally started. And uh, it can be a really hard circumstance. It really can. Um, but here's where we actually get, uh, you know, <laughs> being told that the Messiah has come and... And that uh, there's that Peter's just being reluctant to hear it, that um, uh, he's being reluctant to actually follow through with it, um, and that he doesn't want to hear it. But you know, Andrew just comes in. You know, he's here to take away the sins of the world. He saw the baptism, and I love the fact that Peter refers to John the Baptist as creepy John, because um, <laughs> that's accurate. And also, Matthew spying is delightful. The way that Matthew spies, and he's just so awkward and so not even remotely stealthy, is it just makes me happy. Just how poorly <laughs> of a spy he is. But again, Matthew's portrayal uh, further just it really clicks with me that um just did such a good job with what they were doing with the story with that character as a thing. Um, and. Shmuel and Nicodemus having beef over uh, over John the Baptist's arrest and stuff. Just kind of setting the stage for that. I thought it actually turned out really well. Um, but knowing where the story goes for John the Baptist, uh, you know, makes me sad to see how easily he's just cast aside. And Peter tossing these... N- uh, nets back and forth all throughout the night trying to get a haul. <laughs> I felt that in my soul. Um, I felt like uh, it looked too easy, comparatively speaking. But I also just love Matthew sitting by the beach watching Peter struggle and just taking notes of the whole thing. Um, considering that Matthew's gospel is one of the most detailed gospels from lineages to everything else. It really just tracks with who they've got Matthew as a character. And, um, I also appreciate the Zebedee brothers and everybody else coming to actually rescue Peter and try and help him out, um, with it. Also, Peter's got some guns, like Peter straight up is a, got some Trogdor beefy arms. Just throwing that out there. Um, but, I love the fact that, you know, as they're rowing in, that they're rowing into where Jesus is actually preaching. And um, uh, that just Andrew's response to the Messiah at first, like, um, and where he even tells Peter, trust him as you trust me. I just, I I, I loved that response. Um, And, uh, the fact that they were saying that, that he was the Messiah so quickly felt out of character so early as far as ep- season as episode four, but I get it. And my kids were also super excited to see Mary um, right up front for the sermon uh, on the shore. Um, we know that we don't get any real details in scripture saying that Mary followed along with the disciples. I know that that's not something that is specifically mentioned. Do I think it's specifically probable? Quite possibly. Um, that she would have been a part of everything. I think there are some times, probably not, but again, getting just the beginning of the stories. Um, and, you know, just the fa- the message that, that we're getting uh, with Jesus at this point in time, um, I just think it's really solid and, um, and watching the nets start to fill up, watching Jesus's face with excitement as the nets start to fill up was great. Um, I honestly thought they were going to cut away because they didn't have the budget to do the fish stuff, but they did such a good job and it put such a real and tangible, uh, thing with the nets breaking 
um, with the boats filling up. I, I just thought they really nailed the fish miracle in this capacity. And um, just the amount of turmoil and trauma that um, it did. And Peter jumping out of the boat and going to Jesus. Um, um, if Peter's response, like, I, you know, realistically, if y'all know me, I'm an emotional person. And I was, I was weepy at this point. Um, but then as, uh, Peter and Jesus are starting to walk away, um, uh, and they come to the point where, uh, (laughs) where I know he's going to say, you know, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm just literally like slamming my hands down on the couch saying, say it say it, say the thing. Like I wanted Jesus to say that quote, the way I wanted Captain America to say Avengers assemble. Like I just wanted him. I just, I just needed to hear it said. Um, and, um, my, my kids were pumped about it and, you know, I was too just of actually getting to hear him say these things that, you know, I've heard a million times or preached a million times even, but hearing it said out loud. And I'll just say this, the dude that plays Jesus, he does a really good job. I, there's not any point where I know that's not an actor, but man, I'm genuinely impressed sometimes with that dude as an actor to be able to see how he portrays Jesus. Because I'm telling you that dude's emotion and his heart when he portrays Jesus is fresh to death. Like it is just, it is good. Um, setting up over to episode five, um, we get Jesus lost in the temple, um, or where he's preaching in the temple and the one shot we get of Joseph. It was nice. Um, uh, a youngish Mary. I don't feel like they did a great job making Mary look younger in that shot, but that's just a casting thing, you know, and I know they wanted to tie that right over, but setting up the wedding, um, giving us the relationships and stuff. It was, it was kind of good just to, so that we cared a little bit more about what actually happened at the wedding with the water and everything. But also the way that John the Baptist relates to Nicodemus through all of this stuff. Um, and it's thing Nicodemus at no point is actually fighting John the entire time. Nicodemus is fighting Nicodemus because he is struggling so hard to accept this, to believe what he's seeing, to actually ask questions. And it's hard. Um, and I just, again, Nicodemus's portrayal in season one, uh, I was not ready for how good and how much I cared about that. Um, Mary and Peter crushing grapes together, um, as he can, as he tells her about, um, the fact that he's going to follow the Messiah. Um, and she says, this is the man that I married and they get all kissy <laughs> like with that, um, it was just a good moment. It was a good setting adding. They do a really good job of adding some scene context to these stories, um, that make us think a little bit more the fact that they were crushing grapes and most of the stuff we don't really think about the context of exactly what they were doing it. But, um, them crushing grapes together is beautiful. Um, the way that, uh, again, Eden is just so good with Peter. Um, it's great. Uh, the whole thing with Thomas and the wine and, uh, (laughs) setting up the like, man, I told you so, by the way, I feel like the guy who plays Thomas, um, like looks like a moderately Brown Andrew Garfield. And, um, I really like the wine merchant lady. Um, she has a really cool vibe, um, in her stuff. And again, them setting up for the, when you've got Andrew and Peter uh, debating back and forth over um, how to carry their lunches. Um, that's hilarious to me. Uh, I'll say this too, just on a moderately critical note. There are some times uh, with Andrew's facial hair that they don't sync up in the same episode. Uh, episode three and four, there are some times where in some scenes, Andrew's facial hair is real, real close to shaved. 
and times where it's real thick the next time you see him and they kind of go back and forth. So I just feel like there's some inconsistencies there, but literally just watching these disciples kind of argue about, um, how they're carrying their lunches and where they're going and stuff like that. Um, I also love that Jesus has a backpack because I'm a backpack person. Backpacks are my deal. And seeing Jesus with a backpack just makes me that much happier. Um, and, but yeah, the fact that Jesus is going to this wedding, he's going to honor his mom. He's going to spend time with their family. There's just a lot of cool stuff with that. Um, and that was pretty exciting for me to see just how well that played out overall. Again, still really enjoy John and Nicodemus and, uh, the stuff as they're preparing for the wedding, the dancing, seeing Jesus dance, stuff like that. Them stressing out over the, uh, the wine, just again, another really good setup for giving us a good context or even a fictional perspective of what we would be looking at at the miracle. Um, and for me, uh, the, there's a, I always go back to the Chris Rock joke of um, where he said that you got to love a savior whose first miracle is to keep the party going. Um, but the water into wine miracle is a big miracle. And uh, the fact that Mary comes and asks Jesus to do this when it's not his time yet. And, you know, almost every translation of scripture I've seen when Jesus gives his response to this, he says, woman, my time has not yet come. Um, but in this one, he says mother. So I'm like, OK, y'all went the safe route. That's fine. Um, but the wedding master's toast for the wine and how good it was just really goes to show um, just the depth of this was a big miracle. And all to bring Thomas and these people into the fold together. I just thought it was really well played out. Um, episode 6, Indescribable Passion. Or Compassion. As we go a little bit further with it. Um, we get to the leper. Now, um, they did a good job setting up the... Hey, lepers are forbidden. Pretty early with the merchant and everything. Um, and I like the fact they actually showed that Peter and Andrew paid off their debts. And how much money... They actually had to do that again, fictionalized, but it's cool. And I like seeing uh, uh, Matthew and his homie, his Roman homie, guarding the money. I thought that was pretty neat, too. Um, but you can definitely feel Nicodemus trying so hard with the uh, with the Pharisees, with the, the leaders in the Sanhedrin and everywhere else trying so hard to keep an open heart and open mind. And there's so many times I feel like I feel like what Nicodemus looks like in this situation where I'm just trying to call out to other people in ministry to have an open heart, to be so less, uh, and so, so less, so have so much less animosity and aggressiveness, um, and actually see the hearts and circumstances. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting just to see, uh, Nicodemus argue for that. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, Jesus sending, uh, Peter on home to take care of his family and, um, you know, it was neat. And again, then playing out on the fact with the Praetor Quintus of how Matthew plays out and that his ability to see things makes such a good, like makes him so unique as a tax collector, especially. Um, now real quick, uh, Jesus meeting the Ethiopian woman, great interaction. Um, but I got like two words into, uh, the leper asking Jesus for help before I was weeping. Um, and here I'm sitting beside my kids on the couch and, uh, Rosa is just watching me weep and like kind of making fun of me for being weepy about it. And then she's also trying not to cry. But when he says, please don't turn away from me, I lost it. I was out. I was a hot sobby mess. Um, and, uh, yeah. And honestly, good job on the CGI of healing the leprosy. Um, because that looked pretty fresh. Um, uh, 
I think it also gave a really good context of what it looked like for Jesus just to travel to town to town and actually minister to people and uh, teach. Because the way that people just started like um, piling up around the Zebedee house and everything else, um, it made a difference. And Matthew showing up uh, outside of Peter's place because he had questions about Jesus. Again, just thought it was all really well done. Thought it was smart. Um, and the way that Jesus worked in all these little sermons, uh, just sitting around the table. <laughs> and I know that Peter, Peter is a doer. And for Peter, just to, you know, where he's being told just to, um, just be you that I know that's hard for him. I know that's hard. And for me, like, I always feel like I have to be doing something. I have to be contributing something. I have to be shaping something. And so to just be me and be with Jesus is hard. So <laughs> Peter is stubborn and it's all get out and he has to find a way to actually contribute. So he starts managing and he starts being security and all these other things. And I think that's a really solid picture of what it looks like for us when we're trying to micromanage the gospel and micromanage our relationship with God, that we have to contribute more. Um, and again, we get back to the Pharisees and Shmuel and Nicodemus about, you know, are, are we going to limit God to a box to say what he can and can't do just because he does things we haven't seen yet. Again, I love that heart. I think it's smart. Um, the crowds start building up. Uh, we get the man brought on the mat with lip er, with that had been paralyzed. And, uh, yeah, I just I I pictured it a little bit differently in my mind as a kid, uh, but it worked. <laughs> and just Peter walking through the crowd, hey, this is Jesus of Nazareth. You know what's up? It's like I guarantee Peter would have been like selling merch at the back if you'd given him a chance. Um, but again, Mary being the the compassionate voice helping this man get to the roof. I also love that they bring the kids back from episode three, and that they're the ones that connect with Matthew and. Dude, Matthew just climbing the ladder. I mean, the dude's performance is wonderful. Um, but I really enjoy the kids interacting. They're like, yeah, this is Jesus of Nazareth. We know him. And Peter just, like, freaking yeets uh, Matthew right up the ladder. Um, also, Peter's animosity towards Matthew. Uh, I get why it's there. And I know it's a, a conflict thing to be restored later. But um, I don't love it. Just because as a empathetic character thing, I don't, I don't love it with that. Um, but, uh, we get the thing of them tearing off the roof, lower the friend down. And, um, again, the actor that's playing Jesus, um, uh, the way he looks with compassion, the way he looks at that woman, the way he looks at that man hits my heart. And then the way he turns and like hits the Pharisees with, with the burns, um, because listen, to see Jesus's uh, eyes be so filled with compassion at them to the and not hatred or anger or indignation, but just the the disappointment and the frustration and the I've had it up to here ness with the religious leaders. Um, it's a lot. And the way he handles the religious leaders in this, I thought was just such a great way of doing it. Um, and you know, it just really puts a good perspective for me. And I, I say that this is, you know, for the longest time, people liked reading the message because it gave things a little bit more perspective. Um, I'm gonna tell you this, this will affect the way people read stories and scriptures for generations to come. And so far, I haven't seen anything that's a, that's a negative with that. Um, and uh, I haven't seen anything negative with that. And then we get Nicodemus and Mary, and you can see the hunger and thirst in Nicodemus of how badly he wants um, to know what Jesus is about. And then we get that last little tease at the end of that episode of Jesus and Matthew having a moment in the alleyway. Um, episode seven, which is invitations, um, comes right after that. And, uh, 
They give us Moses and Joshua. Now, at no point in time have I ever pictured Moses looking like this dude. Um, uh, Joshua looks about right. Moses looks a little off for what I picture Moses. But then again, whatever. But what I will say is they did a great job with the snake and comparison and setting and that up later to the conversation that's going to happen with Nicodemus. But it was neat getting a little moment with Moses and Joshua in that capacity. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, we get another picture of Matthew and uh, heading in to his position. We get uh, Nicodemus's wife. And I'm telling you what, Nicodemus's wife is... <laughs> the worst villain in this show to this point um, of just getting in the way of what God is doing because she likes a good status. And I get she's a characterization, but I, I dislike her more than Quintus at this point in time. Um, And Quintus is, you know, just there trying to make sure that he's not going to have a problem. And I get that too. Um, But he said, he's willing to take that on and the disciples uh, preparing to roll out uh, for the next journey. Um, And you start to see the disciples are getting the picture that this isn't what they signed up for, but they're still here for it. And I love that Mary facilitated the conversation with Nicodemus because, you know, somebody had to facilitate that conversation. It wasn't like uh, Nicodemus just rolled up on him in the middle of the night like he's a stalker. But, you know, again, using Mary just for a good story concept, Um, and Matthew going home to try and talk to his parents and the way that he's so outcast with them. Um, I thought it was a good touch, but he genuinely cares and he's trying to get somewhere too. Um, and you know, I appreciate that. The conversation with Nicodemus and Jesus on the rooftop was really solid. It was really good. You could hear the sincerity in Nicodemus's cries and his pleas and his just trying to understand. And I try and picture us that if we were in a place where we were hearing something new for the first time, how well would we be able to handle it? And, you know, seeing where Nicodemus came from, seeing what the world was like at this point in time, the whole you must be born again conversation hits that much harder and that much deeper because that's some revolutionary talk right there to be able to hear at that point in time. And, um, for him to get into John three sixteen, uh, you know, that he gave his only, you know, you know, John three sixteen, but to hear Jesus put John three sixteen in this context of how he's talking to Nicodemus, that's, that's, that kicks the door in that kind of changes the game on what he's going through and puts Nicodemus in that place. And the way Nicodemus responded to it and the way Jesus embraced him, chef's kiss, five stars all around, um, And then we get Jesus calling Matthew and, you know, again, I got weepy with that. And, um, yeah. Um, and I also think I might've skipped over it just a hair, um, in the previous episode. Um, but, uh, at one point in time, they ask Jesus about, uh, Joseph and, uh, we get the reference that Joseph was dead. That's nowhere in scripture, but I do stand by that personally in my own theology. Um, Joseph would have been present if he'd been alive in this story in some way or another. I know some of Jesus's half brothers and sisters were still around. Like they're the ones that tried to throw him off the cliff. But I don't think that we would have made it to this point in the story without Joseph being a little more involved if he was still breathing. Um, And for Mary, just roamed the countryside with Jesus again. um, And to be there at the cross and different things, I feel like. Joseph's dead. I don't feel like theologically Jesus in this context telling these people that Joseph is in heaven um, would match biblically with what Jesus would have said at that point in time. Um, That, you know, I feel like Jesus would have phrased that different. I don't feel that lines up biblically with scripture. I'm not mad at it. I mean, it's a show and they're they're doing a lot of great work. I just don't think that choice would have been an accurate choice for what Jesus would have said with that. And finishing up into episode eight, uh, I am he, as we get Jacob 
and his sons digging the wells. Again, a nice little Old Testament throwback where we get about God's faithfulness in generations. They did a great job with it, setting up for the woman at the well. And this is another good intro of giving us a picture of what it was like for the Samaritan woman. Um, the whole weird husband situation, the five before, you know, it's its own thing. Uh, and I think it was a good setup for people that didn't have a perspective on that or for anyone really. Uh, we get this picture of uh, the party at Matthew's house, which is nice. And it's a real swanky dinner. And I just, my thought is this is the last time we're going to get to see Jesus and his squad have a swanky dinner before they go on the road. The conversation at the dinner table is good. Uh, we get the Pharisees showing back up. And again, just the way that Jesus responds to the Pharisees is always some of my favorite stuff. But then Peter, <laughs> Peter looks like he's posing to be a, a backup dancer in a hip hop video in the eighties. Like Peter does this pose, like he's just about to start break dancing and Peter trying to be so tough. is just hilarious to me. Um, and I get it. If it's in character, it tracks, but it's funny. Um, and, uh, again, we go back to Nicodemus and his wife and just the struggle you see with Nicodemus. This man wants to follow Jesus. This Jesus is what he's been waiting for. And, uh, I also really like the fact that Matthew leaving is what puts Quintus over the top for Jesus. Um, but love the conversations with Peter and Jesus there and the disciples, it's just all really, really well done. Uh, Quintus, or not Quintus, but uh, Nicodemus and Shmuel, that whole you've learned nothing from me conversation. Um, I think Shmuel is a good mirror uh, for Nicodemus to see what he's become and to show him what he has a chance to avoid becoming. And I think that Nicodemus knows that if he doesn't go with Jesus at this point in time, he's probably going to end up becoming what he sees in Shmuel. And that's, that's its own hard conversation. Um, <sighs> yeah. Um, the way that he goes to Eden, uh, Peter's wife to connect with her over, um, their relationship with Peter, the ministry with him. Um, you know, Peter being the married disciple that we see mentioned, it, it's a nice perspective and context, but I also really appreciate the fact that Jesus took time to heal uh, Eden's mom. Now, I don't know that that's actually where that falls in the biblical timeline um, of their events of traveling and ministry, but her just getting out of bed and going to get them food and snacks. Like my kids were like, Oh, that's grandma because my grandma will be sick as a dog and still, um, hop out of bed and do, do, do stuff like that. Um, we get another solid perspective of, uh, the Samaritan woman in the marketplace. And if you notice the one thing she buys is the orange, which plays into the story. Jesus tells us, tells her later. And, um, we get this picture of the disciples, Matthew, everyone else locking up their stuff, getting ready to leave. And dude, just Nicodemus standing there on the side, weeping over the fact he knows that he's not making the choice that he's supposed to be making, um, breaks my heart. And, but he does the very church thing to do. He's like, I'm not going to obey where I know God's calling me to go, but I'm going to donate some money. That is the most, and I say this as a Baptist minister, that is the most Baptist thing to do. Is like, I'm going to donate where I'm not going to go. And that's that's hard. Um, because we, we have Lottie Moon and Annie Armstrong and stuff like that for like, I'm not going to go myself, but I'm going to send money for the people to go. And, you know, Nicodemus by this story contributes, but it breaks his heart not to actually be the one to go. And I'm gonna tell you what, that motivates me not to be that. Oh, by the way, and I know I've already passed that episode. Um, but our favorite line when we were watching the episode, uh, with the roof being torn off, where it's just like someone sitting at the table said, that's my roof. <laughs> and I'm going to be working that into some conversations here on out forward you're just i'm going to be randomly saying that's my roof a kid goes to grab a french fry 
that's my roof. You watch, it's going to happen. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> the <sighs> Matthew's Roman friend coming to talk to his parents, drop off the dog, and he says, I know some people who are mildly <laughs> fond of your son. Um, it's just so hard for me. I, I enjoyed their relationship. The writing was really good in building their characters. Um, Matthew obsessively looking at the map for their directions. Um, it was great. It's just good character building. Uh, Jesus having to put the disciples in check um, about changing directions and going to Samaria. Again, well done. And you got to realize that Jesus did this for three years with these guys. And that this is probably a solid depiction of what it looked like just to get them to go in the right direction. Um, the interaction with the woman at the well honestly went about exactly as I've always pictured it and read it. Um, Jesus calling out her individual husband names and the orange smell thing. That was gorgeous. That was good writing. Um, her running off, <laughs> telling people about who Jesus was. Just well done. Really well done. Um, and honestly, Peter just saying, okay, for real, can we actually start now? Can, can we do this? Can we talk about this? And for Jesus just to say, let's go. Um, that was great. Um, I genuinely thought that was a really well-rounded and well way, well done way of doing it. And honestly, them starting their journey was a really great place to end the first season. Um, I've only watched the first season and I don't know when I'm going to start season two. Season one is on Netflix. Uh, I own season two on Blu-ray because someone brought it by my house and gave it to me. And so I will be checking that out. But for those of you who don't own it, I'll also be scouting out other places to see it. Um, but yeah, it's, I've watched season one and I can honestly say it was a great experience. I thought the acting was well done. I'm genuinely surprised in many areas. I thought the writing was well was really well played off, and it genuinely made me care more about other people. My kids were saying that they had never in their life cared about Nicodemus. He just sounded like a douche because he couldn't, you know, accept it. Um, but now that you see it in that perspective, it really changes things. So, yeah, Chosen Season 1, Knocked It Out, Episodes 4 through 8, uh, highly recommend it. So if you've got Netflix, take some time and do it. I know Christian entertainment can be cringy sometimes, um, but I'm telling you, this, this isn't bad. This was a good life experience, and my quality of life is better. Um, so, yeah. Uh, before I bounce out, I want to take another opportunity to say thank you to our Patreon supporters. Um, Alicia Benson, Candace Davis, Jay Sheed, Jillian, Jason Crutchfield, Mike Perna, Todd Turner, Jonathan Jacobs, Zach Harris, Caleb Grimm, Jeanette Skaggs, Chris Boyer, Chris Cook, Jason Bullock, Christina Ray, Sarah Lewis, Patrick Gale, Rebecca Godlove, and Adam Davis. Thank you all for being such faithful Patreon supporters and helping make faith and fandom possible. And also, I uh, just want to say thank you for all of you who listen, download, and share this in whatever platform uh, you do. Do me a favor and rate, uh, review, and all those other things. Uh, like, share the podcast you like wherever you find them. And also, just throw this out there because I don't say this enough. If you read these books, like my books, go to Amazon and rate them like really well. You know, don't lie if you hate it or anything, but you know, uh, throw some good reviews out there. It makes a difference. Um, remember you can always read, uh, all of the chapters I've written at faithandfandom.org for free in our blog section. And, uh, look forward to starting a fresh 2023 con season out with y'all. Uh, 2023 is our 10 year anniversary. So it's a decade of devotionals and excited about that. But uh, I hope y'all have a great new year and hope if you have watched The Chosen, you enjoyed my commentary. And if you haven't watched The Chosen, maybe you'll try it out. Have a great day. <laughs>